So good afternoon. I'm Daniel. I work for Red Hat, and uh, we will talk about uh, a new subsystem that just happened to be merged in the kernel, which is RV. And uh, <clears throat> so just in a, a summary of what we discussed, I will briefly present what is RV and, uh, and the reasons behind the idea of the patch set. And, and then uh, after the, the, this initial idea and the research purpose that it was, was raised, right, it, uh, it got some attention from the people that are trying to run Linux on safe critical systems. And that motivated the, the, the productization, let's say, of the research. And uh, I'll explain a little bit of where are we now and the structure of the RV in the kernel and uh, putting emphasis on the discussing what is next, what, what will be, what will, will come after. <clears throat> so RV, runtime verification, it, it's a, a lightweight, but still rigorous uh, formal method that is useful for, for the case where you have an actual system. Because instead of relying on, on building an entire model of something and try to verify the model as like statically, uh, RV works by analyzing the trace of a real system. So in, in other words, like the dynamics is, is like, uh, as the system runs, it generates events. And these events are analyzed against a well-defined description of the system, right? <clears throat> we can do some kinds of, of runtime verification. We can do online synchronous when the, the event of the system is analyzed uh, synchronous to the system. So it blocks the system, analyze, and then let the system run. Uh, it can be online asynchronous if like I, I write the event to a trace buffer and then analyze it in user space, but without blocking the system. <clears throat> or we can do offline, like saving the, the trace for file and then later analyzing it. And the, the current method that, that uh, we have in kernel is, is online synchronous. So the analysis should produ produce a verdict saying if it's, it's okay or not. And uh, on online verification, we can also react to, uh, to for example, uh, a verdict that an event, that an event was not expected. And, and then you can react to this, take some actions. <clears throat> so having a, a look in the, with a, a diagram that makes things easy. So in one, one side we have Linux and the system has a, observing the system or generating events from the system that can be analyzed. And in the other side, we have like the formal realm where we have a, a formal description of the desired or undesired behavior. And then we connected these two things into uh, a monitor. And the monitors analyze the <clears throat> blues, the formal specification and the trace. And if things are okay, it should, can you say, okay, everything's okay. Or if an event is not expected, it can react to an unexpected event. So why, why try this former, right? We can do these, these uh, analysis informally. Uh, the reason why it's useful also to be formal, it's uh, because it, it's precise and unambiguous. And uh, uh, when, when you're creating a, a formal specification of the system, you are trying to think uh, 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 about the way that you expect the this, this system to run uh, and, and not exactly about the code. And you are not producing code, you are producing uh, a, a formula, like uh, using an automata or, or, or other ways to, to formalize the specification like the TLA. And, and you can verify your reasoning, you can verify that formula using other approach like checking if your reasoning has a deadlock or not. <clears throat> and uh, the good thing about demonstrating uh, as a behavior using a, a formalism is that it's easier to, to take results to another kind of formalism that I'll explain later uh, in the case of the scheduling latency. And, uh, and moreover, it helps to document the code. But we will get into these points over the, the presentation and it, it will be more clear. <clears throat> so where are we from, right? Uh, the idea of using uh, uh, runtime verification, it was not the goal, it was uh, a need. Because my, in, in my PhD research, my, my main goal was to demonstrate the, the bound for the scheduling latency. And, uh, <clears throat> and the idea was that I could provide evidences for the real-time academic community that Linux had a bound. And to do this, I, I had to explain the system. I firstly tried to explain the system using a uh, natural language like English. Uh, and my English is not that good, but even though that was not the problem, 
the problem was that it's ambiguous. It's not, you cannot clearly see like two plus two. And, uh, and I also tried to find a way that would be meaningful for Linux developers to, to look at it and say, okay, uh, I, I got the idea and, and I can understand it and I can check it. So, and I, the way I found the formalism I found was uh, the automata and I was able to, to create a mod of the preemption mod of Linux. <clears throat> so I could model the preemption mod of Linux using automata and turn it to this, this publication. It, it, it presents all the details. It was a very, very large system, like more than 9,000 states, uh, but it was built on a set of small automatas. So it's possible to create large models from small models. And uh, the formalism I used was automata. Uh, it is more known because of this graphical format that's easier to understand. Like, but this, this drawing here, it has a formal structure using sets. So I use that automata, that's the part that is helped to bring from one kind of formalism to the other, right? So I explained Linux using this formalism <clears throat> and then translated it in a set of uh, of lemmas and did a theorem that explained the, the schedule latency. And it was uh, understood by the real-time community. And, uh, and, and that was a goal. But as I was doing, so my, my goal was to, to provide evidences of the scheduling bound. But as I was doing the, this verification of the model, I ended up finding problems in the kernel and reporting problems in the kernel that my model described the system as it should. I firstly tried, tried the model until the model uh, started to produce meaningful results. But after a while, I started seeing that the model was correct and the kernel not. Then I started uh, reporting bugs. <clears throat> and, and these, and as I was doing this, people were, were giving me feedback that these, my, my, side, my side product of the PhD could be more important than my real goal, that was the latency, which was, okay, if I could, run this specification, any specification using a formal method uh, in the kernel and could check if the, the kernel is behaving as expected, we could use it for, for multiple reasons like testing or to provide other kinds of demonstration. And, and that motivated the, the development of this paper that <clears throat> I tried to make a, an efficient way to transform like an, an automata into something that I could run and I could produce and do the monitoring and could produce some verdict. And here's the paper with the details. Uh, <clears throat> the good thing was that running the automaton kernel was, because it's just an O of one operation, it was faster than tracing the system for a later analysis. So this is, I, here is just one example. So uh, I have the system running as is, the more operations, the better. And I have the system tracing. And, and here is, was the system uh, analyzing those tracing kernel running the automata. So the main idea here is, is that, okay, it, 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 it gives some overhead to the system. Th these are extreme cases, right? But it adds some overhead, but the overhead is, is lower than tracing for later analysis. And, uh, and we can conclude things like, okay, if I can do this, this efficiently and we can run trace in, uh, <clears throat> we can run trace in production, we can also do analysis in production. And then, <clears throat> While I was showing these proof of concepts, yeah, talking about proof of concepts, uh, I ended up meeting the people that work with safe or critical systems in the, the ELISA working group at Linux Foundation. <clears throat> and then uh, when, when I, I, I did this presentation at ELC 2019, <clears throat> and then people from MobileY, Intel, and, uh, and other people in the, in the ELISA work group came to talk to me because <clears throat> They say that there are some kinds of testing and documentation that we need to do to provide to certification authorities to, to certify that uh, the system can run as a safe critical system. And the usage of formal methods was the top, top level. It was the one that provided more benefits. And, uh, and the main, main, I'm not an expert on the safety analysis, right? Uh, but trying to, to summarize, the, it was a good thing to use the runtime verification with Automata because uh, it produced a documentation of the system using a, a, a formal expression. We can verify if the system is, is behaving 
as in, in the documentation, and we can actually run the documentation when we run the automata in kernel. So we don't have this step of translating uh, uh, the test into code, right? The test, the documentation, or better. We don't have the step of translating documentation into code. The code and documentation are the same thing. Just express it one in uh, a draw and another in the code. But they are both the, from the same source. <clears throat> and we can also have these this monitors at runtime reacting to unexpected events as the safety critical system runs. So if something didn't run as expected, uh, you can like uh, shut off the system and go in a fail safe mode. So, and, and that motivated, that, that gave, gave me the motivation, that community gave me the motivation to pursue it, trying to productize this research, right? And, uh, and another good point is that there are very strict uh, rules that we need to follow to apply those things to safety critical systems. And, uh, and, and the good thing about the RV with Automata was that it was pure and C straightforward code. And uh, I was just using a statically allocated memory, no loops and, and so on. So it, it is the kind of code that is it's closer to the kind of code that people generally certify for safety critical system. And, and here is the, the, the talk where I was talking as this as a proof of concept. So <clears throat> while you're working with the, the people in Elisa, mainly Gabriele Paoloni, uh, we started drawing the, the idea of how we can fit the runtime verification into the safety analysis that people need to do, right? So we, we start with the requirements of the system. These are the requirements that we need. And, and then we do the we create the, the specification, do the analysis, and try to exercise this analysis. So we create a documentation using a formal uh, uh, format, using automata, and then we try to verify the system. So until the point where we get the <clears throat> our requirements well-defined or defined well enough so that the monitor can, can produce only uh, real verdicts, like we start modeling a system or start modeling a, a specification, probably not in the correct way, right? And then we start refining it and understanding as the system runs and we keep going to the circle. Okay, I model the system this way. The runtime verification say that it, there is a problem here. The problem is not the codes and the specification. So you go in a cycle and you showing that your specification is, is, is reasonable or is good enough. <clears throat> and and uh, so it use, we use it to refine the, our specifications, like refine the reasoning and check the reasoning against the real system, and we can also monitor it as the system runs uh, if necessary, if that's a critical enough uh, operation that we need to constantly monitor. So RV can be used to, to document the kernel, and uh, then we can, can show how the system should behave or not. And uh, another point, if you see this presentation, it goes deeper into this safety analysis Gabriele, Gabriele goes deeper here in this presentation and, and he explains <clears throat> how we can use RV to break down because the, the kernel is, is too big to be certified as a black box or it's too hard to certify it as a black box. So the idea of this presentation it shows that we can split the kernel into small pieces using runtime verification. We say this block should, should behave this way, this block should behave this way, and these small blocks can be certified as black box. And, uh, and, and here's the, the it's, I think it was at Plumbers uh, last year, where we explained how do we glue runtime verification with the safety analysis. And, uh, but the expert on this is Gabriel, it's not me. I'm just helping with the, the technical side. <clears throat> so where are we now? The good thing is that we are merged in part, right? I, when I submitted this presentation, it was under submission yet, but said, but it happened to be merged for the 6.0. The idea was to present here the pad set, but as it's merged, I will present uh, the, <clears throat> the things as they are in the kernel now. But the thing that was merged is just the initial part, and then later we talk about what is next. <clears throat> so trying to get some, some, some abstractions that you have here, right? Rem recalling that, that uh, diagram, so we have this monitor <clears throat> that connects the the, the model, the specification, with uh, uh, the instrumentation, and then we call this a monitor. A reactor 
is an action that can be taken when an unexpected uh, event happens, right? And the monitors can be enabled at runtime and each monitor can have its own reactor enabled. <clears throat> so I, I would try to share this video here, oh, just a second. I've tried before, it didn't run smooth, but let's try anyway. Come on, you can do it. So, the, the, the interface, <laughs> now the interface is stored inside the, the tracing subsystem. Uh, I stored it there because uh, RV consumes trace and, uh, and these file abstractions that uh, Stephen has on the TraceFS, they are, they are handy. <clears throat> just showing here, this, this system is just uh, regular mainline kernel 6.0. Come on, video. I was typing faster than that when I made the video. So <clears throat> here is the interface. We have the available monitors that show all the monitors that I have loaded in the system. Each monitor is that part of a, a little bit of automata and a little bit of uh, instrumentation. Here we have these two, <clears throat> two monitors and uh, we have these reactors available. So we can uh, do a print K, we can panic, or you can do no operation, which is the, the full case. This, this is uh, the enable, it's like the set events in F-Trace. So it says that there is no enabled monitor. I don't know. I, I'm I'm not used to this laptop. <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll keep it running because it runs so slow that you do your operation, it will be still in the same page. Uh, switch. I'm trying. Let's see. I know their speakers just brightness. <laughs> oh, that's that's brightness. Yeah. But is that, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it's, that that's a did, different. Did it make it, well, that's just brightness, I think. Right. So does it make it better or worse? <clears throat> Which bring it down here? Is that better? Or worse. Yeah. Oh, that, that's this screen, not that screen. Oh, well, so oh, it doesn't affect the output. Shoot. Yeah, it's too bad. I don't know which one would be contrast. Does anything you know which one's edge is there? Is this contrast? Oh, that's probably brightness. Yeah, that's brightness. Uh, okay, I tried. Uh, which one? Go, go back to the video. Okay. It's on the this this one. An auto. Right, that's 1080p. Well, this this is going through uh, BVD, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know exactly it work. I don't know if it's going to hurt. If I what? Reduce it to what? What's it at? So it's 720. So if I. Better or worse? Well, the thing is, this is BVB. It might kill the server. I don't know. Yeah, that, that's probably why it's running slow. It's because yeah. of the server. <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm going to put it back to auto just because I tried. Because I have trouble reading that. Oh. Come on, BBB. So here we have like, uh, we have this thing, monitoring is on and reacting is on. So if I start, if I run a monitor, it start monitors. If we have a, a reaction, it will react. So here I'm saying echo WIP to enable monitor. So I'm enabling the monitor. And it says now it's enabled. It resembles F trace on purpose. 
And uh, ah, let me try something. Okay, available events. So the the monitors also create a set of uh, events that uh, we can uh, observe via anything that we can trace. For example, we can observe via perf or via ftrace. And so here I'm enabling all the events for the monitors. <clears throat> and uh, if I see the the trace, I swear I type faster than that. And see here, here are the events. I'm saying I'm in the preemptive, I have preemptive disable, no no preemptive. I mean preempt no preemptive, preempt enable, you know, preempt. So you can follow the monitor as it runs. Okay, I'll try to just jump to the Okay, I, I just jumped into the, each monitor has its own folder. And in this folder, I have some files that says the description, if I can enable it and change the reactor. And, and here I can change the reactor, say from, from knob to print K. So I, I've set print K as the, mon, as the reaction. And if I do the mask, I will see the reaction here. So there was a print case saying that this event was not expected. <clears throat> and I can panic the system as well. <clears throat> so <clears throat> another thing that is in the patch set are, is the monitor synthesis, <clears throat> which is, there is a tool called .2k and uh, and it is used to to translate a mon a automata into a monitor that can run in the kernel. And so uh, the monitor that the dot to see creates it uses a set of macros to expand the the entire monitor code. Uh, so people doesn't need to reimplement the the basic automata automata verification each time. And I use the C macros to make every monitor independent from one or the other. And the only thing left to do is the instrumentation part. <clears throat> That's, this is the last video, right? I, I will try to, I'll try to show how this actually works. I'll try just to move the video by hand instead of letting it play. <clears throat> so here I say, here I have the wip.dot file. It's a dot file from GraphViz, and uh, it has an automata the specification. And here I will run the dot two k program, saying that I want to translate this wip into a monitor, <clears throat> and this monitor is a per CPU monitor. So each CPU have a uh, one monitor running because the preemption zebo is. This monitor uses print disable, which is a per CPU thing. <clears throat> so, oops, too much. So I, I've run the, the command and it will create these files. So it creates a directory. Inside this directory, we have two files. <clears throat> and here it gives a checklist of how to integrate this monitor into the kernel. So this file, is the is the dot age and it's a, a C representation of the automata and, and it's a directly direct translation. There is a documentation in the kernel that explains this translation. <clears throat> and here is, is the monitor itself. It <coughs> it has some sections uh, and, and it tells what to do, but most of the part to do the work is just uh, it's just changing these handlers or for the events, telling uh, which uh, a trace point will handle these events. So I direct a trace point to a, to a, a handler that will handle the event, throwing the, the, this event inside the, 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 the runtime verification monitor that's created. It, it will be easier if the video just run, but 
it runs so slow that it's it's not helping. So <clears throat> the RVL is structure. <coughs> we have this interface inside the tracing. <clears throat> and here we have the files that uh, the, the RV.c here, it does the startup and the registration and control of monitors. I reg it, it, it register the monitors and give me that interface to enable and disable. And the RV reactor, it, uh, it is the control of what reactor is running for each monitor. And we have like examples of reactors here. Each monitor has a, its own folder that, that, that has those two files, uh, the monitor, uh, the instrumentation part, and the automata part. And it's important to keep them separated because uh, it's more clean or it's more, let's say, it's easy to justify that this is a formal method if you keep the formula in one side and not embed it in the code. And then we have a set of headers that are responsible for <clears throat> the files that I use to register a monitor, and that serves to generate the code uh, that analyzes the automata. So the, 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 the person doing the anal the, the monitor doesn't need to re-implement them. And also when we do the safety analysis on the code, we can just do it in one code and not for each monitor. <clears throat> and here we have a set of tools, that is that dot to c that uh, translate automata into code and have some templates file that are used to generate these monitors. And, and I also have here some uh, sample monitors, the, the dot file, the automata, and they can be used as a starting point. Here I have another video that shows how to edit it. There are multiple ways to edit automata, but I better not, not play video anymore. <clears throat> and also, and as important as the code is that the, the current pet set has a, a, a let's say, Nice, a nice set of documentation that explains all the, the idea, the how I, I translate automata into the, the dot file, <clears throat> into C code. So <coughs> you can use that to, to understand the things that, that are there. And if also for each monitor, there is an explanation of what the monitor does, the reasons behind it, and, and how to read it. <clears throat> so all those things, Fortunately, we're merged, but they are just the starting of this, this subsystem, if we can call it a subsystem. <clears throat> so, just a second. This is a, a, a monitor that has, has been, uh, that we developed together with the, the, the ELISA working group. It's hard to see here, but the idea is that we can follow all the operations that we can on a watchdog that brings to the system to have a, a watchdog armed. So one needs to open the watchdog uh, device, need to start it, need the system, and ping it at least once to reach to the safe state. <clears throat> so for us to have a system, for us to have a watchdog as a safety monitor for the system, we need to follow these steps and keep running around this, uh, <coughs> this state, which is considered the safe state. If, uh, if these things, if this, the sequence of events is not uh, provided correctly, we will not hit the, the safe state and we cannot uh, start the, uh, the critical operation on the system. Uh, it was part of the initial implementation of the pad set, but, uh, and, and it is generic, it should work for uh, any watchdog, but in, in the patch set, when I, I submitted it, I had the automata monitor and a set of options, and it was not clear for everybody what was the monitor and what were the options. <clears throat> and uh, to avoid confusions, I, I took off this patch set, this patch, which was a single patch, and I will send a patch set explaining uh, this is part of the monitor, this is, uh, these are the options that enrich the monitor. And, and, uh, and so things will be clear for reviewers to understand. It was my fault. It's just had to make it more, more digestible. <clears throat> and the pet set included a, 
the user space tool that exercise the monitor. Uh, another thing that uh, if, if we if we check now, all the monitors they, they doesn't have any any way that we can feed it with options. So, uh, for example, in the watchdog monitor, I, I have an event that set a, a safe timeout, and the safe timeout has an argument that is, for example, ten seconds or one second. Uh, I have no way to set these uh, options for the monitors yet, and uh, <clears throat> but questions? No. Okay. So the idea here is that each, as each monitor has a folder, I can have a file there with the options for each monitor because monitors will have different options, and uh, I'm not sure yet if I will have a one op one file per option or if I have a single file with a set of options and specify, okay, this option is an integer, this option is, is a, a char, and that, that, that's something that I, I still need to think and discuss with people. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, yeah. Uh, so uh, about synchronization, uh, first of all, for the, the monitor, uh, how do you do locking when it's not when it's per CPU? It's one thing. When it's global, it's maybe something else. And how do you guarantee that you don't impact the system or have a priority inversion or things like that in your monitor? Okay, the monitor it's monitoring an event of the system, right? In general, these events of the system right provide the synchronization with the other people that would use that event. Uh, for example, in the scheduler, the sched wake up and the sched switch they are protected by the RQ lock. So generally, the system already provides you the, 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 the locking mechanism that will provide the atomicity for the things that, that can run concurrently with that event. Okay, so Not, your state transition is sometimes protected by the, the, the color locks. Yes, Okay. most of the case. In the future, we might need to add this, <clears throat> this synchronization inside the monitor. But the, the way that is using macros like trace points. So you just need to change the macros, the macros and provide like, instead of a declare a per CPU monitor, you can say declare a per CPU monitor locked. Yeah. And then we can expand. But yeah. so far, so far the, the, the atomicity is provided by, by the event that's being generated. Same question about the reactors. So you have a printk reactor, printk can have side effects uh, when uh, invoked. So do you invoke it uh, from the color context or you, schedule, you do an IRQ work to let it for, run somewhere else? I'm calling for from the, the colors context, but I'm using print K deferred because I cannot call print K yet in the... Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, good question. You went, went to the code straight. So yeah, we have these options. Uh, another thing is that at, at this point, Initially, I have made everything as a, as a module, and then I start integrating with the kernel. Uh, all these functions here, they, are, they were thought to be exported for, for, for other modules, so we can uh, load uh, monitors as modules. But to avoid uh, problems in initial implementation, I just didn't export it. So I can still have some time to think about it and to avoid problems to myself in the future. But it should be straightforward. These are the functions that I need to export. So I can have it as, as modules. One, one thing that people ask it many times is that why not making these things with eBPF? And uh, yes, it's also possible to have uh, these monitors with eBPF. There are some pros and cons of having it in kernel and eBPF. But <clears throat> one thing that I made clear is that I'm, I'm not creating tracing features or creating language. Uh, I'm a user of these technologies. And the, the more technologies we can have to use, and as long as we have the people that justify that development, you know, I, I, I will use it. I, I'm not uh, a, a fanboy of any, let's say, uh, language. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I have a tool that is .bpf, that it's like the .2k that translates monitoring to C code. It translates into a bpf. The idea is, is almost the same. It uses uh, libbpf and C, so I can reuse all those headers that I, I use in the, the in-kernel implementation. I just need to create some if-defs, 
saying, okay, get uh, get percipial variable or get percipial map. <clears throat> I I'm still didn't send it because it has a dependency on, on this. I, I wanted to first close one, one implementation in C and, and have it revisit, review it, and now I can try to edit and make those things use the same code base. And uh, there's also other kinds of monitors that I'm using. And uh, I'm using, no, we are still developing. I work with uh, ETH Zurich and, uh, and the University of Copenhagen, two other monitors that do offline or uh, online asynchronous. And I'm using Trace and VPF for that. So there will be space for everybody. <laughs> and, uh, but the main, the main motivation so far for these monitors is the usage on safety critical systems. And these safety critical systems, they have a, a, a set of, uh, of rules that they need to follow to be qualified as a, a safe system, right? And the rules for the pure C code are already there. And they are, they are well established and the RV was de developed somehow with that in mind, right? Uh, but, uh, but still, we need to, to make an effort that is more in documentation part and, and reviewing the code part to, to, to try to qualify that C code for a safety critical system. Uh, I did it initially with that in mind, but uh, there is still this work that need to be done and it might uh, <coughs> result in changes on the code or in the creation of another type of mo uh, monitor that is qualified. And, and that's the work that we are, I'm doing with the people in the ELISA working group and Red Hat is supporting me on that. And, and finally, there is this, <clears throat> this part of integrating. So th this always started with the preemption model, but I'm still not proposing it, right? Uh, because it will require some extra work in the instrumentation. Uh, and that is that WIP monitor, it reports an, an, uh, a limitation of tracing uh, preemptive disable events. That's why it causes reaction. And I need to fix that problem before trying to integrate the preemption model for the preemptrt. <clears throat> and and yes, <clears throat> part part of my work now it will be uh, trying to to instruct people on how to create other monitors and and do other monitors myself. And I said I, I'm creating mechanism for other types of formalism. The the language is MiPhoto that we can also use and expand RV, not only with automata, but including other ways to express uh, formulas. Um, so in this, this is more complex than automata, hello, timings in equations, it, it will be nice. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it. Sorry for the videos, it didn't work well. Questions? Um, so have you tried using, uh, on, on your models, uh, using a SAT solver or using a, um, a, a spin model checker for to check, okay, in, in what I have modeled, I validated that when the kernel runs, it actually fits the description. And then from that description, can I explore all the possible state combinations and see if it matches some, some constraints? Yes, you can do that. It, like what I did for the preemption model is that I use a tool <clears throat> that for the, the development of automata and that tool that is Supremica, it's an academic tool. It already gave me some kinds of, uh, of uh, things that I could check. For example, I could check if, my, if there was a deadlocks inside the automata and assuming that Linux works correctly, there should be no deadlocks on my automata. <clears throat> so there are tools for making that but they are generally in, in the phase that where you are developing the, the formalism, right? Um, for automata, there are, I think it's most common and most simple way to, to, to formalize something. There are a lot of tools for that. Uh, but the other thing is that how can, I, how can I take out the information from the automata that I'm running to see what were the visited states, how many times that the event happened, that, that thing is easy to be done in, on top of this current uh, implementation because I can just hook to the events generated by my automata and, and do the analysis on that. And that's why I'm exporting the, <clears throat> the results as trace points because then we can connect them.
And still, there, there is all, all these ideas to be developed there. And, and that's a good thing. Hey, Joe. Hi, David. Hello? Yeah, so uh, I, I was just curious, uh, have you implemented like liveness uh, checking and deadlock checking and all that kind of stuff? So th th these Already. things can be done in the automata with tools like Supremica. Okay. Yeah, that, 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 that can be done in the development phase of the automata. And uh, yeah. do, do, do we need to implement those, those tools? Maybe, I, I don't know. But yeah. the, for the automata, there are those liveness and check if there are deadlocks, if there are yeah, live but, I, uh, So you're saying that it doesn't make sense to check that at runtime? Or? I think as you have the formal description, we are trying to check the formal description itself, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes yeah. sense. So, so you can do yeah. that in, uh, in the development in the phase of the tool itself, yeah. I, I did that for the preemption model during the... Okay. And then the other question, I guess, is do you feel like trace points are sufficient to drive the, the model? Or you feel like... Because I, I can envision like anybody who needs to use this stuff, they'll need to have the trace points, right? In the first place. Yeah. Um, and so the question is like, how much detail can you expose through the trace point interface? And at what point will that be like, you know, adding trace points just, just to, just just to, to make justify the, the monitor? Yeah. Yeah. So one, one limitation or one characteristic of runtime verification is that I can only verify what I can trace. If I cannot trace, I cannot verify that that's just not the correct tool, right? So if you have a monitor that needs a uh, trace point that doesn't exist, we can <clears throat> probably in C code, we can uh, do it uh, at runtime, losing K probes, more overhead, blah, 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 or trying to, to convince the maintainer to add trace points. Yeah. As, lo <clears throat> as long as the, as the monitor just is adding a trace point, but yes, we depend on trace points or trace points or anything we can trace. Microphone. Yeah, uh, the, I think you uh, on the call as callbacks on the trace points, right? Yes. So you don't depend on whatever is exposed as ABI to user space. So and there are trace points now in the scheduler that are callbacks only, and we can modify those as as we wish, yeah, yeah. as we want. And they are at, uh, haven't they been added for you actually? Those trace points? Yeah, they, they they are. I can hook. So they, were, uh, they, they were added for. Uh, People writing kernel modules to get like yeah. scheduler. But we, uh, we, we had that discussion at Plumbers in LA, I think. Yeah. And then, and then uh, I, I was presenting the model and uh, we discussed with Peter because of the deadline events that I proposed some, some years ago. Yeah. And he said, okay, as long as you don't export, we, you can add those events. Exactly, so, we, so you can add them. Yeah, yeah. but the good, the good thing about these trace points or these things that you can export via trace is that many people depend on it nowadays, like BPF is, is entirely built on top of that. So I'm just another user of, uh, of this infrastructure. So it's, I think this would also be quite interesting, um, bringing it to user space with new um, probes or even better, like you, the user space dynamic trace points where you can actually coordinate you can verify uh, the runnability with the kernel and applications working together. Yeah. Uh, I could see a lot of power of that, especially with the user space dynamic trace points, because the user yeah. space, the developers, they specify the and variable. Then you, and then, and that, that's just translating a little bit. So now we can have uh, trace points on user space, and you can also add a U probe for quite a while. So you can create a single view of the system. Integrating both user space with U probes and user trace points and the kernel with the kernel trace points with a single view of the how things should behave. Yes, that's that, that that's an interesting use case. And, and that probably will be a, a a user for these now user defined trace points. That, 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 that's why it's a good thing to depend on trace points because many people depend on trace points already. Trace point, trace events, and, and the function tracing, anything we can hook. Oh, yeah, I think the time is also over. That's it. Thank you all.